due to uh, Her Excellency Grace Akilo, Uganda's High Commissioner to India. Uh, Uganda's High Commissioner to India, for you know, uh, I, I should mention on a personal note, uh, has been very proactive and uh, you know really uh, been very encouraging of this initiative, this webinar we are organizing. And uh, Madam, can you hear me? I can hear you very well. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. And uh, she has a gift for writing. Uh, she is apparently a great admirer of what India is, or at least, uh, you know, how India is handling the pandemic and the lessons it holds for the Uganda and the African continent. Uh, Excellency, I would like you to focus in your remarks for five to six minutes maximum uh, on this particular aspect that what is the relevance or how do you look at the Indian experience uh, or so far the way India has handled the pandemic and what lessons or what is, what is the value of that experience for uh, for Africa also I've seen that you know all the you know what we have done as acts of solidarity for example the lamp lighting the lighting and all that uh, Uganda had created quite a buzz and uh, uh, and in other parts of Africa how do you look at this cultural affinity and going forward in terms of setting the agenda for India Africa the next India Africa summit can you talk about some iconic projects that two countries can partner, two, two regions can partner with? Over to you, Your Excellency. Well, thank you very much. First, I would like to thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, Ambassador, uh, our, the High Commission of India to Nairobi for chairing this and bringing out the issues that we are all uh, grappling with very, very clearly. Uh, so I want to thank you, Excellency, Mr. Chabra. I would like to salute all of you, Excellencies, um, Ambassadors, High Commissioners, and Senior Officials from whichever part of the world you are listening to this webinar. Um, and thank you for participating in it. Uh, I think I will echo my, my Dean's um, quote of the Africa Day theme as silencing the guns and say that while the continent had actually worked very closely towards achieving this. And I think that there have been some notable achievements on the continent with a few hotspots here and there, but basically it was moving towards it and it would have mopped up everything. Well, then coronavirus started its own guns on the continent, but that perhaps that's why we are all here. So I just want to concentrate on um, the two questions that uh, have been asked by our convener and uh, one start by saying that um, Uganda India relationship during this uh, is divided into three sections once prior to COVID, during COVID, and after COVID. Very briefly, I'll say that before uh, COVID, we had high level consultations in many areas, which culminated in ministerial meetings. Uh, we were working on a mechanism to establish uh, collaboration between our drug agencies especially in Uganda, in my country, Uganda, they wanted to collaborate with the, with the counterpart agency, of course, bigger, with the wider responsibilities, the drug agency of India. Then um, before COVID, we had the private sector engagements in uh, Uganda, between Uganda and India, where you got, uh, the private sector in India has gone to Uganda and established hospitals and established diagnostic centers and is working on pharmaceuticals and, and the pharmaceutical industries. One of the most notable of these uh, was the donation by the government of India of uh, uh, a cancer, a cancer machine in our Uganda Cancer Institute, which was very well welcomed. This was done during the visit of the Prime Minister Modi. Uh, Prime Minister Modi. And then we had an, an, an NGO, a pharmaceutical company, donating a mobile ban, a mobile cancer ban throughout the country. That was prior to COVID. Then COVID hits us and uh, my president requests permission to talk to the Prime Minister of India because of the warm relations that exist between us. Uh, this call was made between the two principals and uh, the object of that call was solidarity, but more than the solidarity, the president actually made a request for some drugs to be sent to Uganda, which India obliged and sent us some drugs for which we thank the country very, very much. Uh, but I think the discussion had gone further than that, the, the physical acquisition of the drugs. The Uganda were thinking of being able to manufacture some of this uh, COVID, especially the hydrochloroquine uh, by itself. And so there's already an Indian company, CIPLA, well-established in Uganda, 
And so these resources were availed by the government of India to CIPLA to be able to manufacture hydrochloroquine on the ground. We thank you very much for this. Now, post COVID in the health sector, I think that the high level consultations on, on health issues should continue. Uh, in, indeed, I, I, I would say that uh, the health ministers should feature highly in one of the uh, forum summit uh, events because there was uh, defense ministers, then there was uh, agriculture ministers, and I don't recall there being a meeting put in this summit, within the context of the summit for health ministers, and I think this is a very important area. Another very important area for, for Uganda in particular, and, and I feel very strongly about this, is that we, we wanted to establish a link between our drugs authority and the Indian drugs authority. This is because we have a very, very big problem of fake drugs entering our market. And some of our suppliers, you know, will tell you this is for treating, especially malaria, uh, this is for treating this and the other, and the efficacy of the drugs, some of them were found to be zero. And we know that India produces better drugs and has the, the means to monitor the drug production, the, the people who produce these drugs and so on. And Uganda wanted to collaborate very much and still wants to collaborate with the Indian Drugs Authority. Then another area of uh, research now, another area of collaboration post-COVID would be a very close working relationship with our virus uh, institute in Entebbe. We, I think that Uganda has a lot to offer on the research that they have done on virology, because for example, we dealt with Ebola, but also now we are seeing that India is, uh, is uh, a much more advanced, uh, has got much more advanced research capacity than us and technologies. So we want to form very close collaboration with us then we should also facilitate the private sector to, to set pharmaceuticals in, 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 in Africa, if you like, but in, in the particular case of Uganda, in Uganda, there is no reason why we should not establish joint research between uh, the formal conventional med medicines research, as well as the Ayurveda, with some of the facilities and some of the resources that we have in Uganda. As you know, Africa has got uh, roots, its, root, its tradition of root medicine, herbal medicines, which goes centuries, and some of them are more effective than the others. And indeed, they are resources of some of the material for manufacturing drugs. So why don't we take this opportunity now to go into Africa, Uganda-India relation, I mean, uh, Africa-India relationship, go into Africa and like my dean said, locate there and do some research on uh, African herbs and roots medicines. Now, I will talk about something else, which is, um, which would be iconic, I guess, but not so iconic in the sense that agriculture you know, in Africa, we, we have, Africa has about 25% of the, of, of, of the planet's uh, land, land mass. And if our agriculture were unleashed and had the sort of revolution that has happened in other parts of the world, Africa, the, the, the planet would not need to worry about food at all because Africa would supply the food. This also would be the, the starting point for a big industrialization pro program throughout Africa. And some of the African countries which have actually uh, uh, had their economies grow, have grown from this industrialization of the agricultural sector because the agricultural sector provides jobs for the youth and the youth problem will be solved. Agricultural sector, when it's properly utilized, industrialized manufacturing, agro-processing will produce for you credible quantities of goods in large quantities, which will supply not only the domestic markets in, in the various countries in Africa, which will not, will not only supply indeed Africa itself, it will be a food supply for the world, all kinds of uh, food related. However, the green, tech, the green revolution that I'm looking for, uh, we are worried a little bit about it because we, we have learned a lot about how the revol uh, the, that revolution has been hijacked by some high companies, high chemical industries, which produce chemicals which kill the soils. So we have had the advantage of looking at the green revolutions in other countries, indeed in India, how you attained it with your massive irrigation, massive fertilizer use, and so on, and farmer education and adaptation. You, you were successful in that. So we would like to learn, and uh, if we were to move into that area, India would make a big impact. Because the most important thing in a person's life, all of our lives, is food. And I think one of the items that we all were very worried about during the COVID uh, experience was where to get the next food from. Unfortunately for India, it was in bountiful supply, but it could have been. Some people didn't have enough in some other areas. And so a, a, a revolution, Africa's green revolution should be 
what we should uh, focus on. Now, with this revolution comes the issue which my dean again talked about, domesticating some of your industries in Africa. Africa's uh, uh, agriculture is embedded with so many problems, but yet it is an agriculture which is dependent on all technologies. India has got a large array of uh, agro, agro technologies which, it should, which could be manufactured on the continent, and some of them could be reproduced for the particular circumstances, the soils and the land area and so on, of the regions in Africa. So why don't we domesticate this in, in the, on the continent? Last, let me touch very, very briefly on um, the funding mechanism. Now, uh, our, our, our chairman talked about lines of credit, for which I thank him. But I think that we have to look at uh, uh, these lines of credit or the money that India is putting out to Africa uh, with, with a lot of creativity. Because some countries may not be able, all of us now are worried about uh, self-reliance, self-reliance. And the issue about self-reliance, one of the issues around self-reliance is this uh, fear of uh, you know, uh, being financially strapped, you know, uh, debts, foreign debts. So, and many of us are looking at it now. Now, um, on the other hand, we have a private sector, which India is famous for, which could take advantage of this money which India has for Africa and use it creatively to achieve the same goals in Africa. So while we are talking about lines of credit, I think one of the areas we we'll need to look at in, in this post-COVID uh, um, analysis of our relation is how we can actually get the money that India has for Africa developed uh, and not make a loss out of it. Because I understand the principle is that if you give, it, give out the loan, you get some, some returns from that loan. I want to stop there and I want to thank you again very much for giving me this time and I hope I haven't taken too much of it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you.